Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to another edition of ZK Study Club. Uh, this week, we're excited to welcome back Benny Chen and Benedict Boons to talk about their recent work, Protoscar, uh, on generic efficient IBC schemes. Um, so with that, Benny, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. And thanks for the introduction. And thanks, to everyone, for coming. Uh, I'm Bing Yi, and today Bandit uh, and I will present Protostar, which is a new generic but also efficient incrementally verifiable computation scheme. Okay. Um, wait. So why is not okay? It's working. Okay. So let's consider the following problem. Okay. So imagine you have in initial input z0, and you've done some computation and obtained some output zm. What well, the computation is some what some like uh, iterative computation, but in each step. You are running some step function given the previous output and some online witness, which can be different for each step. And finally you get this output. So now how could you prove to someone else that, uh, and efficiently proving it to someone else that CM is actually the correct output rather than, than some garbage values. So more precisely, how could you prove that there do exist some intermediate witness such that each intermediate um, execution of step function was done correctly. And finally the, uh, output is the M. So the solution to this problem can be quite useful, for example, in blockchain world, because this type of computation actually capture a lot of scenarios. For example, verifiable delay function, here the step function is just the run function and uh, the number of iterations, basically the hardness parameter. And also like succinct blockchain, like MENA, well, you can understand this uh, intermediate output ZI as the ledger state, and you can understand this online witness as some um, transactions coming in the block. And more uh, importantly, recently there's a really popular application, ZKEVM, which is basically proving the correct execution of a block of EVM transactions. Well, here the step function is a little diff uh, different, but not much. Basically it's a, a family of functions, which consists of uh, multiple OP codes. And at each step, you can pick one of the OP code to execute. And given this is really useful and uh, meaningful to start this problem, but interestingly, actually, this kind of problem has already been studied a long, long time ago, even like around Bitcoin was invented. Uh, back in 2008, Paul Valens already uh, introduced this great notion of IVC, where in the scheme, the prover can iteratively generate some uh, small proofs given the previous proof, which we call uh, IVC proof. Here's the pi m here, pi m minus one here. And given this, and given also the online uh, witness you should be able to generate the next IVC proof. And finally, the verifier only needs to take this final output plus this really tiny uh, IVC proof to ensure or to check that all the previous computation were done correctly. And we require that suppose these intermediate proofers are all honest uh, and they have the right witness. In truth, they should be able to generate the correct proof that pass the verifier check finally. And it's so-called completeness. And on the other hand, informally uh, and intuitively, if the verifier has passed some uh, passed the true for proof for a check for some proof, like pi m here, it should be the case that all the, this possibly malicious prover are actually knowing some valid witness. And intuitively, this is what's so called knowledge soundness. And more generally, it's not always uh, we don't need to restrict to proof like this kind of chain of computation. We can be more general, like proving like tree of computation or deck of computation or some more general uh, like topology of computations. And this is called uh, proof carrying data or PCD. And, but for simplicity uh, in this talk, we are focused on IVC, but we know that the techniques in this paper can also be generalized to work for PCD as well. Okay, so it is well known that actually the IVC scheme can be uh, constructed from another really powerful primitive like SNARKs, which is a uh, primitive, like enable you to prove the correct execution of some gigantic circuit of computation using some really small proof, which can be easily verified. So here the idea is basically uh, very simple, which is like uh, basically a recursive SNARK, where the IVC prover will just generate a SNARK proof for the statements that the last execution of the step function was done correctly, and the previous IVC proof was verified correctly uh, by the SNARK verifier. So we have to embed this circuit inside this uh, large circuit as well. And this is, uh, this is a really neat and simple idea. However, uh, in practice, it's not so performance because mainly because the, uh, in this circuit, in this recursive circuit, 
the snark verification part can be really expensive. It can be really takes a lot of constraint to capture the logic of a snark verifier. Moreover, because of the use of snark, you have to use some like expensive pairing friendly cycles or trusted setup, which is also undesirable. Given this, many researchers were exploring the way where there exists another way to construct snarks without using snarks. Can we do it more efficiently from some other weaker primitives? And one particular um, popular and uh, promising direction is the so-called split accumulation scheme or folding scheme uh, introduced by BCLMS20, uh, I've seen published in TCC20, uh, and also the NOVA paper in 2021. Uh, and Basically, the idea is the folding. So given some MP relation, uh, the accumulation scheme or the folding scheme, uh, the, the goal is to reduce the task of proving two MP instances into proving a single instance. How to do that? The idea is that given two instances with some witness pair, we have some way to merge them together into a single one so that we only need to check the folded one rather than the one that we had before. More specifically, we have these following algorithms in the scheme. Well, the first we have accumulation prover algorithm, which will take some two instances with this pair, like x1, w1, and x2, w2. And usually the instance parts, the x1 uh, parts are usually small, while the uh, witness part can be possibly large. And then taking this as input, the accumulation prover can merge them together and uh, fold it into another instance with this pair, which is x, w. Okay, and then, there's another algorithm called accumulation verifier that will check that this uh, folded instance is done correctly, is computed correctly. Basically, it, it, it will take some small input, x1, x2, and get some meta information from the prover and check that the outputted uh, folded instance was the correct one, okay? And the final, uh, also I want to mention here is that one highlight here is the accumulation verifier is usually much cheaper than the snark verifier. And it can be uh, can use much smaller circuit to represent this accumulation verifier, which is the key that we can have a much more efficient IVC scheme. Okay, so after having this, having this folded instance with pair, there will be another algorithm called decider that will check that this instance with with a pair is inside the relation. Okay, so this is the accumulation scheme, and uh, similarly, it, it needs to uh, satisfy the following requirement first uh, that if the original instance x1, x2 are satisfiable, it must be the case that folded instance is also satisfiable. On the other hand, if the accumulator prover can generate some witness, some folded witness uh, that has the final deciding check, it must be the case that he also know the corresponding witness for the original two instances that was folded before. And that's the intuition of knowledge soundness. Okay, given this, it turns out to be quite easy uh, to, to generate or to build an IVC scheme from accumulation scheme. The general idea, uh, this is already explained in the previous paper, but uh, the general idea is the following, that the idea is just to uh, iteratively and continuously uh, folding some running statements about, uh, about the following uh, stuff, so the following statement. First is the last execution of the step function was done correctly, and Second is that uh, the output accumulator, uh, in particular out output accumulator instance was folded correctly. So after having this proof, it's okay for the IVC prover to iteratively generate this accumulator from, the, from some NARC instances, for example, from some NARC proofs. And, after, and then we can, so we ensure that this instance was done correctly given this proof and and we use this uh, accumulation prover to generate the folded instance with pair. And after having that, we can ensure that as long as the final resulting accumulation accumulator is checked correctly by the decider, which will be run the verifier, all the previous computation was, will be done correctly. And also because we have this proof, which has been checked, the, uh, the accumulator is also the correct one that needs to be checked. So that's the general idea. But the highlight here is that in this scheme, the IVC prover only needs to generate some non-interactive proof, which might not be succinct for some small circuits because the accumulator verifier circuit is much smaller than snark verifier circuit. That's why in, in a concrete sense, it's much more in, uh, efficient. Okay, so there's one uh, small caveat here is that we don't have any guarantee that this decider is really, really succinct. 
like we don't have like a guarantee that it's always constant complexity and the complexity of it might be linear to the instance size. But this is easy to resolve by adding another snark that delegates the computation of decider at the end. So finally, the IVC proof will only uh, run this, uh, uh, check this snark proof rather than running the decider himself. Okay, so I that's- That's just one one thing, can you- Yeah, go ahead. It's, you know, there's a, it's constant in, one, one thing that is important is the decider will always be constant in the number of iterations. So in, there's, yes. there's two things, there's the size of the function f, and then there's the number of iterations. So both the accumulator and the, the entire bit accumulator, so the witness and the instance, um, are, and the decider are constant in the size and the number of steps, but uh, some parts here, so uh, especially the accumulator witness and the decider do not have to be constant in the function, uh, in the step function. Exactly. In, in general, it is still satisfied the notion of IVC, where IVC's notion only requires that the verified complexity is independent of the number of iterations, which here we still satisfy. But it's just uh, in, in practice, if the circuit is large, maybe the decider complexity can be relatively large compared to checking a snark proof. Yeah. Okay, great. So- uh, I, I, have a, I have a question about the- um how the concrete security depends on the number of iterations. Uh, I'm, I think that's maybe a complicated subject, so we should perhaps leave that to the end. Yeah, maybe we can uh, discuss this in the end. I think this is a good question, but uh, yeah, we can we can discuss later uh, after the, this talk, I guess, yeah, of this uh, presentation. Yeah, Bendik, please help me to remember this, uh, this question, yeah. Great. So uh, given this background, we, we know that there is already there are already some very efficient uh, construction of IVC, like Nova and also in BCLMS20. Basically, the accumulation verifier complexity is only around like two or three group exponentiation. However, there's still a gap for supporting some advanced uh, uh, application like CKEBM. The main reason are twofold. The first is that the existing accumulation scheme usually only support R1CS constraint system, for example, NOVA or PCL MS20. And this R1CS is a type of constraint system that's a kind of really traditional and is kind of less expressive than some recent advanced uh, gates like high degree gates or lookup gates. By expressive, what I mean is that basically uh, to represent the same type of functionality, for example, a leap curve addition, you might, you might only need like one or two uh, constraints if you are using high degree gates, but you might need more if you're using R1CS. So we are saying the high degree gate can be more expressive in terms of, in terms of its uh, representation power. And this is really useful also in, in the EVM applications. And we also know that while, while we have this finished this paper, we also know there's also some other really elegant follow-up like Sangria and Origami that still support Plunk or Lookup gates but there is uh, some caveat here. The main issue is that if, when the degree of the gate increases, the folding complexity also uh, grows by a factor of D, which is the degree of the gates. That means you can kind of cancel out the advantage of using this expressive gates because the amortized cost per gates can also increase. So you might not be, uh, you might better just use Nova in that case. So this is not enough, I think. Uh, and this is one of the good features that are missing. And second one is that uh, we do not have really efficient circuit branching support for most of the scheme, except some recent work called Supernova. What does it mean? The mean, uh, let me illustrate by example. Let's just assume there's a, like we want to simulate EVM execution and the EVM has uh, hundreds of OP code, right? And in each step, what you want to do is just to pick one of them and execute. But if you are using Nova, what you can do is only to embed all this OP code gadget inside a single recursive circuit and do some routing when, when you do the proving. And the folding complexity will uh, like consequently be proportional to the sum of the size of these OP code uh, circuits, which is uh, undesirable because there are hundreds of OP codes. So what we want is to have another scheme where the recursive circuit size is only proportional to the single OP code that has been being executed at runtime. That can save us a lot of uh, uh, proving cost because the circuits can be much smaller when the number of instruction is a lot. So we, we, we highlight that these two requirements are really essential and important for ZK-EVM applications because first, ZK-EVM are heavily using this 
like with recent advanced type of gates. And second, EVM do have a lot of uh, instructions, like hundreds of instructions in their uh, instruction set. Beyond this, another uh, different reason why we want to have a new paper here is because we see that many existing scheme of IVC do have really different flavors of description as well as uh, security proofs. It would be great if we can have a unified and general form framework for understanding all this IVC scheme and make the uh, make the analysis and the development much easier. So that's another motivation of Protostar. So given this, uh, I want to highlight our contribution here is that uh, first we have come up with a new general recipe for constructing IVC scheme and more precisely the folding scheme. Basically given some MP relation R and given some um, special sound interact protocol for relation R, we can generically transform it into some folding scheme uh, for this relation. And it turns out to be actually quite efficient. And NOVA is just the one special case in this modular framework. And second, we also construct some really efficient special sound protocols, which I will, I will talk about later. Uh, uh, some special sound protocol for some really expressive relations, like high degree gaze, lookup relation, non-uniform circuit selection, and also CCS, which is a recent advancement on the constraint system, which is generalization of R1CS to a higher degree gaze. And the result, and by combining these two parts, the first part general recipe, the second part the special sound protocol, we obtain a new IVC scheme called Protostar. And the highlight here is that dominant cost of IVC proving is only a one MSM of size of the witness, and the also a, a, snark, a knock proof for the recursive circuit that's dominated by three group of exponentiations. In particular, there's no dependence in terms of the number of group exponentiations. There's no dependence on the gate degree as well as the lookup table size. Also, we know that there is a, a concurrent work, Hypernova, which is also really an elegant work. Uh, and uh, they also achieve some similar results. And the difference here is that we think that our support to lookup seems to be much more uh, cheaper. Almost for us, like our support to lookup is almost for free, while their support for lookup can um, can add a lot of overhead. And second, in this recursive circuits, we know that a number of uh, uh, hash, hash operation and a non-native field operation in the side circuit is also significantly uh, smaller in our case. And moreover, because our support lookup, the circuit for non-native field operation can be even, even smaller. So it gives them even more advantage uh, out of that. So we think that for some application like CKEVM, it can be favorable, uh, Protostar can be, can be a favorable choice. Okay, so that's the contribution. And now let me uh, go to the, the detail part and let me explain how the general recipe works for uh, building a folding schemes. Okay, so recall that our main goal uh, here is that given multiple instance witness pairs, we want to fold them into a single one, right? And we follow the framework as, as below. Basically, we have three steps. First, for some MP relation R, we first have some multi-run special sound protocol for it, which turns out to be usually pretty easy and we'll load it later. And after having this interactive special sound protocol, we can use some really standard trick to transform into a non-interactive argument of knowledge. And after that, we, can, uh, we propose to have a generic and efficient transform to construct a folding scheme for the, verif for the set of verifier check in these NARC proofs. And this is basically a generalization of NOVA, okay? So but at this point, uh, still is, is still not good enough because the, uh, as, as the degree of the gate increases, still the number of group operations is still proportional to the degree of the gates. So that's another key here is that we add one more step at the beginning. Well, given some interact protocol uh, for this relation R, we add one more round and transform it into another interactive uh, special sound protocol, but with a much more compressed verified check. So the, the least set of verified check is much simpler and, and has much lower, like mostly has not a, a lot of, not a lot of uh, high degree gates. And after that, we use the same transformation as we did before. And it turns out the resulting scheme becomes much more uh, efficient in terms of number of group operations. In particular, the number of group operations now is independent of the degree of the verified check. So that's the general framework. And let me go into more details later. 
So for now, any any quick questions? Okay, so uh, before coming to the detail of construction, let me quickly rec recap what a special sum protocol is, since I already mentioned it for multiple times. So uh, intuitively, what special sum protocol means is this following. So given some relation R, suppose you have to some interact protocol for the for proving this relation R, and we say this protocol is k special sum if it uh, if given k difference accepting transcript, we, we would be able to extract some witness for this relation. Then we say it's k special special sum. For example, let's take this very really naive example where there's no public inputs. But the goal of prover is just to prove to the verifier that he knows some really long vectors, A, B, C, that satisfy some head map product relations. And there's a really naive special sum protocol for it. Basically, the prover just send the, the entire witness, A, B, C, to the verifier. And the verifier just check all the equation to be checked in order to, uh, to ensure that it's inside the head amount product relations. And this is still a special sum protocol. And first is obviously one special sum because every accepting transcripts is basically just the accepting of bad witness inside the relation. And we know there are three uh, important parameters we care about in an interact protocol. The first is R, which is the number of runs uh, that prover will send messages. So here you see this non-interactive, basically just on only one move, so R equals one. And the second, there is a parameter called D, which is the maximal degree of the set of equations checked by the verifier. And third is uh, another uh, parameter is L, which is the number of che checks done by the verifier. So, so more specifically in this example, the verifier will uh, conduct n different equation checks. Each of them is just a multiplication, right? So because multiplication is degree two, that means D here equals two and L here equals M because we check n different uh, equations here. And to, to express in some language of a smart circuit, but this basically ends in the number of uh, constraints in a circuit, and this is basically the gate of the de uh, degree of the gate. Okay, so that is it. That's special sum protocol. And before coming to the next step, I want to uh, highlight one, one more thing here is that usually it's much, much easier to design a special sum protocol uh, for some relation. And the main reason I think here is that we don't have any requirements on the complexity of this communication as well as the complexity of this, the verifier checks. So basically the prover can send a lot of things, can send a really, really gigantic, uh, possibly large witness together to, to the verifier, and the verifier can do a lot of checks to check these things inside the relation, and still is a valid special sum protocol. So that this makes our analysis and the uh, uh, design much easier to think of, thinking in the special sum case, uh, protocol case. Okay, so now suppose we have this uh, interact protocol, which is special sum. We can use really some really standard tricks to transform it into a non-interactive argument of knowledge uh, using commit and open and fear shamir. So basically, finally, what you get is uh, is a tra NARC transcript. Basically, consists of two parts. The first part is the short commitments to the messages that's being sent initially in this uh, original protocol, and the second part is the big openings. Uh, of these commitments, which is basically the message sent by the prover in the initial protocol. And also you need to come up with some uh, random challenges using fear sham yield. And it, is, it was proved by some previous work that as long as the original protocol is special sound, the resulting NOC, NOC protocol also have knowledge soundness. So basically now we, we have attempt, obtained some NOC proof for the same relation R, um, but uh, also have knowledge soundness. And our goal is reduced to fold these NOC proofs, okay? And uh, for now, uh, let's see, we have already have this NOC proof for this relation. For simplicity, let me just uh, assume the public input is empty, but when the public is not empty, we just put it inside the instance part of this proof. So now in this NOC proof, we have two parts. The first part is what we call a uh, proof instance, which consists of short commitments to the messages and the challenges uh, and possibly public input, which we will ignore for simplicity. And second part is the this long prover messages. And this knock proof is valid if and only if a set of L equations are checked correctly. So if and only if these L equations are evaluated to zero. And here, the each equation out of this L equation in FD, we, for simplicity, we assume is homogeneous. It means that every term of this uh, Algebra formula exactly have degree D in this input. 
For example, x1 times x2 plus x1 squared is, uh, is homogeneous because every term is degree 2, while x1 plus x1 squared is not because x1 has degree 1, while x1 squared has degree 2. But for simplicity, let's assume that every term are, are the same. But it's actually without loss of generality because suppose we have some other more general formula, okay, uh, which is inhomogeneous, we can just add a slack variable here, u as an input, and we can pad every terms to exactly degree d by multiplying the power of u. And here in this not instance, we just set u to be one, right? So it's, it's without loss of generality and for simplicity, let's always consider this case. So now our goal is to fold this knock proof and, uh, and build accumulator out of it. And the accumulator exactly have really similar form, which also have these commitments uh, and challenges and proof of message fields. The only difference here is that we add one more uh, error vector commitment inside this accumulated instance, which is uh, some short commitment to some long vector uh, error vectors. And also the set of checks by the accumulator is changed a little bit. Well, in each equation, uh, instead of requiring it to be exactly evaluating to zero, it's okay to be evaluating some other non-zero values. As long as these L final L values are exactly consistent with the com commitments inside this uh, accum accumulated instance. And this is some trick very similar to, I think similar to Nova uh, and also BCIMS 20. Okay, so now uh, our goal is to, is to fold this uh, uh, knock proof onto this accumulator one by one, okay? So that's our goal and recall the, the main goal here is to want to have a new accumulator instance such that if the new one is satisfiable, then all these checks, all this previous check for a previous accumulator check and this not proof will also be correct. So how to do that? Um, a general idea is that we see that this, this structure, these two structures are really similar. They all have the same formula FD here. And what we can do, we can interpolate them using polynomial, okay? So let's consider the following polynomial well, we replace every message by the by some linear polynomial that is interpolating both the messages from the accumulator as well as from the knock. So for example, we use x times m plus m prime to replace m prime and m, and similarly use x times r plus r prime to re replace those challenges. Why we care about this polynomial? The idea here is that uh, because this FD is homogeneous, it has a really good feature and a property because uh, basically, if you see the constant coefficient of this set of polynomials, they exactly matches the left-hand side of the accumulator's check. And if you see the degree D coefficients of, the, of this uh, polynomial, they exactly matches the left-hand side of this knock verifier. And let me illustrate it by one very simple example. Let's say there's only one equation being checked. Well, L is one. So there's only one polynomial to be considered and the degree equals two, and this uh, formula is just R1 squared. And then we rewrite it in this uh, polynomial um, representation, replace everything with linear polynomial and expand it. Well, now we do, we replace R1 to be this and the, do the square again, and we expand it. And we see some magic happens. It's exactly that constant term is actually accumulated check and the degree two term is actually not verified check. So this is one simple example, but believe me, it holds it more generally. And given this feature, given this property, it gives us a really good way to, to check that the previous two checks are done correctly. Basically, this is equivalent to check that this polynomial has the following form. First, the constant coefficient exactly is some vector being committed in, in E here, and the degree D coefficient is exactly zero. Right, so we only need to prove that. And how to do that? The idea is the following. So we, we represent uh, uh, this polynomial in this form, this coefficient form, and the prover only needs to commit this polynomial and show that exactly this right-hand side polynomial has this form. So the idea is the following. The prover will just send this intermediate cross arrow terms, which will bind this polynomial. And sometimes because EJ can be long because there are L number of equations being checked, so we need some Patterson commitment to make it short. And after that, we can reduce this polynomial check to, to some random evaluation check. Well, the verifier will just sample some random challenges. And now this kind of check can be reduced to uh, this, this check. Well, X is replaced by this random values alpha. And you see that this is exactly a new 
type of accumulator check. The only difference is that the message becomes the linear combination using alpha, and the error terms also become some linear combination of the original cross error terms and error vector commitments. And so that gives us a really natural way to do folding, which also is also similar in Nova, is that we just do the random linear combination, for instance, and uh, error commitments. And the prover will additionally fold this witness as well. Okay, so for now, I'm kind of a little bit cheating because I'm always arguing the soundness, but actually what we need is something called knowledge soundness. So we should be able to extract the original witness for these uh, two checks, right? But actually the idea is quite similar. So proved by previous work, it's sufficient to only consider special soundness. And we can prove that this protocol satisfies D plus one special soundness. Basically given D plus one different transcript with different challenges, then we can like, first we can pick two accepting transcript and extract out like solving some equation, equations and extract out MM prime here. And the second step is to prove that those MM prime and RR prime are the correct witness. And that is also uh, simple because this FD is a degree D polynomial and this polynomial check uh, are matching for D plus one points. That also means that these two polynomial are exactly, are exactly identical by some fundamental algebraic uh, theorem. And that means uh, the extracting M and M prime exactly matches this, uh, these equations because the constant coefficients matches and the degree D coefficient also matches. So that proves that the extract witness is a uh, is valid witness. So that's an intuition, but uh, I refer to paper for more detailed and more formal proof. Okay, so at this point, it's, uh, it's still not very good enough, right? Because when you can see when D is, good in, uh, D is large, the number of group operations by prover is actually uh, around D times L because you have to commit to D minus one cross error terms here, each of which is length L. Similarly, the verifier needs to combine the error commitments and that accounts for D group operations, which is uh, really expensive if D is large. So we need to figure out a way to make this um, much more efficient. Any questions so far? Okay, so let's see how we can uh, optimize this scheme. You see, the, I, the reason that we need this DL group operation is exactly because we need to do some patterns and commitments make, to make it short, right? Well, each vector is of length L and L is usually really large because the number of constraints is really, really large per circuit. But let's suppose we have some special sum protocol in which there's only one check, okay? In that ideal case, we, we don't need to use this patterns and commitment, right? Because the vector itself is already short. We, just, uh, we can just uh, send them in the clear without using any group operations. So this gives some idea. The idea is just to, given some any general special sum protocol, can we transform it into a, another protocol that's proving the same relation, but the only use a uh, single check, basically L equals one. If that's the case, when we do the folding step, we can be much more efficient. So that's the general idea. And the solution to it is also pretty simple. So suppose we have two gates, two equations, we can introduce one random variable and do the linear combination of it. And it's easy to check if the final resulting gates is satisfiable, then this hyperability original one is also the satisfiable. And now we successfully merge these two gates into a single uh, gates, okay? And more generally, given L different equation, we can um, interpolate all this L equation into a single equation using the power of beta. Uh, power of theta. And this gives some idea of doing transformation. Okay, so more precisely, given a, a, some initial protocol, which is special sound, what we do is that a verifier will sample a random challenge and like merge all the checks we had before into a single check, which is the, basically the random combination of the all the checks. Okay, but this, this special sound protocol is not good enough yet because the gate degree or the check, the degree of the check becomes much higher because in, some, in one term, we need to multiply by beta to the L. So degree becomes D plus L and L is large. So still we have a really bad scheme that's expensive. But this issue is actually not, not very difficult to solve. The idea is to see and understand this power of beta as a single value, as a single difference message rather than a power of beta. So what we do is the following. So after example this beta, the prover will compute 
the power of beta himself and send the last message as this power of beta. Okay, and uh, uh, and then the new check becomes the following. So instead of writing this as beta to the J, we all need to write as a BJ, which is the one of the message being sent by prover. And now the degree is only D plus one. Okay, so this kind of solved the issue of high degree, uh, the degree low up. However, they also introduced some two another two other issues. The first, first issue is that the prover needs to send more messages. Basically, it needs to additionally send L messages. That means later it has to commit to, to these L terms, which can be expensive. And second issue is that the verifier also needs to check that these messages are done correctly, which I'll talk about later. So let's focus on the first issue uh, here, where the prover is more expensive. And the solution to that is actually pretty easy. Well, instead of representing a power of beta using a single variable, we can represent it as a product of two variables. Or even more generally, we can represent a product of three, two, or even k variables, right? And that means instead of sending all this power of beta, uh, power of beta, the prover only needs to send this. It only needs to send the square root L number of message, bi and the bi prime. Well, bi prime is the beta to the i times square root L. And still you can have this uh, check, which is only degree d plus two. And more generally, if you using k different product, you have we have like less message to be sent, but a higher degree. But usually we find it a sweet spot to using, uh, using two because initially already prover already needs to put some efforts. So uh, using two already in, decrease from L to square root L. So usually it should be, su should, should be sufficient. Okay, so this solves the first issue. Uh, well, the prover's complexity doesn't increase much. And the second issue is the following. So recall again that initially what we have is we have L different degree D gates, right? And using this trick, we transform into a single degree D gates. Uh, however, we also introduce additionally square root L degree two checks here, which seems doesn't solve the problem. But the, but the key observation here is that the additional check are low degree. So what we can do is that we separate the checks into two parts. The first part is a single degree D uh, checks, which we are using D minus one cross error terms. However, these D minus one error terms are, are really short. So we can just using uh, field operations rather than uh, Patterson commitments. And second part is this part. And we do need to add one more uh, cross error vector commitments to commit these square root L terms. However, because it's low degree, we all need to add one more uh, separate commitment for that instead of D of them. So that solves the issue. And finally, what we get is still like the, the verifier only needs to perform R plus two group exponentiations. And the plus two here is coming from two parts. The first part is the extra message being sent by the prover. And the other one is the extra separate commitment for this uh, squared L checks. And we also note that a great thing here is that when we later support lookup, it really doesn't add any uh, overhead because we have a special sum protocol for lookup that only involves degree two checks. We can batch all those checks inside this uh, invest uh, accumulator checks, and we don't need to introduce any extra commitments out of it. So that's also one reason that we can have really good support for lookup. Okay, so in summary, uh, the general recipe works as follows. Given some MP complete relation, suppose we have some interactive protocol for a uh, special sum protocol for it, we first transform into some another special sum protocol that has compressed the verifier check and use some standard trick to make it a non-interactive arguments of knowledge. And finally, we use this uh, generic way to make a folding scheme for this NUC verifier. And then we use some previous works idea, uh, the IVC compiler to construct an IVC scheme. In particular, if you want to have more efficient construction, you can use the recently uh, like proposed work by Dan and uh, Wilson that has using cycle curves uh, to, to build IVC, which is also some idea that has been uh, described in NOVA paper. Okay, so basically now we have reduced the problem of constructing IVC for some expressive relation into the problem of building some special sum protocol for some expressive constraint system, right? And it turns out to be actually pretty uh, easy. In, in particular, we have obtained some only one move special sound protocols for a lot of building block relations like permutation relation, high degree gate relation, non-uniform circuit selection, and the CCS, uh, which is uh, some recent advancement on constraint system. 
And the main uh, and this scheme is really almost trivial. It's very similar to the naive example I mentioned before. The idea is just let the, the prover send the entire witness. And the verifier will just check the set of algebraic equations that represent this relation. And the main reason that we can do this is because all these building block relations, they can be represented as a set of algebra equations over the initial witness. Okay, so this makes the design of very, very easy. And this is also justified the, the claim I had before that building multi run special sum protocol for many interesting relations can be actually pretty easy. And there's one uh, like subtle exception here, which is lookup relation because we don't have a really straightforward way to represent this look operation as a set of algebraic equation only over the, uh, over the lookup values. But it turns out we can still have a really uh, simple and efficient special sum protocol for it. And here the interaction will help. Okay, so let's, let me quickly recap what lookup is. So lookup relation is saying that given some uh, online lookup value, which consists of L values, we want to prove that there are, they exist, uh, they belong to some preprocessed table of elements, T, which consists of uh, T elements, where T can be really large, depending on the table size. And um, like proof by this, uh, this paper by Hobbock in 2022 called log derivative uh, from, for, for lookup, which is also a really elegant paper and recommends everyone to read it. Um, it shows that so this lookup relation holds true if and only if this fractional ident identity holds true. Uh, more precisely, if only there exists some multiplicity mi such that these two sum of fractional identity hold true, where the first one is one over x plus wi, and the, the terms in the second sum is uh, mi over x plus ti. So intuitively, what mi means here is that it is the number of appearance of this uh, element ti inside this lookup set, right? So basically, if, if that's the case, you can generate this mi. If not, then the fractional this polynomial identity on the left-hand side won't be equal to the right-hand side. So basically, uh, this, this one holds true. That's the, that's the general intuition. And given this, we can come up with a special sum protocol. The idea is also quite, uh, quite similar to what we did before, is that we replace x with some random values by verifier. So the idea is the following. In the, in the initial round, the prover will send this witness and the multiplicity which will bind these two polynomial, a fractional polynomial identity. And after that, it reduced to check that this fractional identity evaluation are equal over some random value R. So verify will sample this random challenge and the prover will, send, will compute this fractional identity evaluations and send it back. And now the verify only needs to check that these two sum are equal and also needs to check that this uh, vector being sent by prover are computed correctly using some degree two checks. Okay, so make sure the H and the G are, are computed correctly. And we note here that there's one great feature of this special sum protocol is that even though the proof of message can be quite long, like uh, have length T, they are actually pretty sparse. Basically the number of non-zero elements inside these messages can be less than, uh, can only be, will only will be less than L, which is significantly smaller than T. And that means when later, when you want to commit to it, the committing complexity can be much smaller because we don't need to do anything for those entries that are zero. And this gives us uh, some inspiration that maybe we can have a really efficient IVC for, uh, or not IVC, for folding scheme for, for this lookup relation. However, there's a one subtle challenge, the, the, the reason is the following. So remember that in this folding scheme, in this folding protocol, at the beginning of this folding protocol, the prover needs to send those intermediate cross error terms, right? And the computation of these error terms actually depends not only on this uh, online knock proof, but also on the uh, accumulated messages. But the accumulated messages is actually not sparse because they basically there's some randomly combination of multiple, uh, multiple proof of messages. So that means the computation of the error terms can, can amount to OT number of field operation, which is no longer independent of T. However, uh, we, we note that actually what we need is just the commitment of these uh, cross error terms. And it turns out we can compute them homomorphically given the accumulated message commitments and accumulated error vector commitments without bothering to recompute all the vectors on the line. So that's the general idea of uh, uh, saving these TOT operations and still have an, a complexity that's independent of table size. 
Okay, so uh, I want to note one more thing here is that this lookup protocol can be easily generalized to support vector lookups. Well, basically every element in this table is just a vector of elements rather than a single element. And this can be quite useful in application like 32-bit uh, arithmetics, where you just uh, store all those input-output uh, arithmetic pairs and you just do lookup in the circuits, which can be really useful and is heavily used in ZKEVM. Okay, so after having this uh, uh, sub protocols for building block relations, uh, if we want to have some MP-complete relation for uh, for some expressive constraint system, what we do is just composition, right? We just compo compose all the sub protocol to obtain the final sub uh, protocol, uh, which is special sound, and it's for this uh, MP complete relation. And this uh, field, the last piece of our story, and we now uh, have two parts. First, we have a general recipe for building folding scheme given some special sound protocol. Second, we have really simple special sample for some really expressive relation. And by combining these two, we obtain protostar, which is a new IVC scheme in which the uh, recursive circuit is only dominated by three group exponentiations. And in particular, we can support a uh, really high degree gates, really large lookup table, and really a lot of uh, uh, OP codes being executed in some instruction set. Uh, I think that's basically it. And thanks uh, everyone for listening. And now I'm happy to discuss more and answering questions. I saw there, there are some cash questions in the chat, not? Okay, cool. I know those are just yeah. the papers. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, maybe we can discuss the, first discuss the question uh, on that uh, road, right? Ben, did you want to give a comment first? Uh, uh, okay. Yes, so, so um, when you're computing the, the concrete security, so um, the, that determines what parameters you want to use. Um, do you need to take into account the um, the maximum length of a, an RBC chain um, in your application, or um, so how does the concrete security depend on that? So, um, well, the interesting thing is that the provable security is actually. Um, uh, basically says you can only do IVC for a constant number of steps. Um, mm -hmm. So even like constant in the security parameter, um, which, and the reason for it is that, you know, the, the, every time I, uh, when I do the security proof, I call the extractor and then I call the extractor of the previous proof and these things sort of blow up uh, multiplicatively. So um, after, T steps of, of IVC recursion, my extractor is actually size something like poly lambda to the T. Um, mm -hmm. And if that gets too large, if that gets larger than the polynomial, then at least theoretically this becomes an issue because it's 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 sort of meaningless to say, oh, you know, I, I now have an extractor which can break some assumption, but if that extractor is exponential size, then it, it sort of becomes a vacuous statement. This, however, is only a theoretical issue. Um, I think practically, there really is not any. Um, let me let me think. But my I my interest. Don't in see any. Right? I don't see any practical implications. Yeah, I think if the field, T on the security. Yeah, right? field size so, is so not usually concretely my... can support multiple steps. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, here's my intuition that um, let, let's say your proof system is such that you need to find a um, um, a, a targeted hash um, collision. Um, so you could build a table that um, includes all of your possible targets over multiple steps, um, and then it's not clear that you want losing security if you have um, more targets. Yeah, I mean, I think another way to look at it is if we, at, at multiple points, in, and this is where the theoretical issues come in, at multiple points, we transform interactive protocols to non-interactive protocols. And that's even, that's, that's absolutely necessary for getting something like IVC. Otherwise, the notion sort of becomes meaningless. But you could look at sort of the unrolled, like underneath it are inter interactive protocol. And you could look at the sort of, you know, it would be like T times R round, you know, uh, interactive protocol, because the, even the accumulation scheme 
is derived from an interactive protocol and then applying to get you into it. Um, and I don't think we know for 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 these for special sound protocols, and this this only holds true for, for these special sound protocols. Um, there's not really any any issue in in sequentially composing them um, for T rounds. Uh, yeah, and also so I'm I not think, saying anything wrong, but yeah, I think the parameter like uh, the not the R also the degree D also affect the the concrete security bonds. But I think for reasonable large number of uh, R or D, usually it shouldn't be the be an issue uh, in practice. But of course, mm -hmm. if you like D is super high, then we definitely will blow up. Yeah. So, so what what you said about unrolling the protocol as as, as though it were one big um, interactive protocol to which you applied Fiat Shamir, it sounds as though you might be able to to prove something about that. Um, it's probably a yeah, but it's really not like the important thing is so so. Yeah, you could maybe prove something. The problem is, it's really like, like one thing that is important to understand is that that kind of um, these IVC constructions, it's not the same. Um, we don't just apply PHMEA once, right? It's not just like you have yeah. some big old interactive protocol and you apply it. Yeah. PHMEA once. It's you apply PHMEA of like the 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 intermediate components, like for example the accumulation scheme and the intermediate and then you implement within the circuit right you build a circuit for um that right non-interactive protocol and you cannot build a circuit for an interactive protocol right like so it, it doesn't you know like uh, the, yep. the the the, the, the it back just back. doesn't really like it doesn't really track i'm just trying to give an intuition here right like there isn't really a meaningful thing that you can do or prove security about it just i'm just trying to say that like yeah the composition of uh, like T round or like uh, composing special sound protocols uh, sequentially seems to be fine, and these things are derived from uh, special sound protocols. But that's kind okay. of all. So we it's do. A that's only heuristic argument. Yeah, yeah, it's very heuristic. Yeah. By the way, another heuristic. Like, what is right? better is yeah. I'll go ahead. Sorry. Oh, uh, like one thing that you can do if you care about the heuristics. So we um. Uh, we like uh, so I think when you mentioned this, so you, we we've given uh, like these accumulation schemes. They work for kind of uh, you can build basically the IVC chain in in a line, but you could also build it in a tree, um, because we give basically a folding argument for um, uh, you know you could also fold two accumulators together or, or uh, stuff like that, and then instead of building a line, you build a tree. And then at least you get a, like your depth is only logarithmic and um, uh, in the length of the computation. And um, then some of these issues uh, become a little bit better. And another advantage of using a tree is that uh, sometimes it also help with parallelizations. Like if you want to compute all the leaves together, right? You can compute all the leaves in parallel and uh, do it layer by layer and it can be even faster. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Um yeah, the, there was a thing that I um uh pointed out in a um I think a previous time when you did a, a similar talk, which is the the um optimization where you use a um the square root of um uh the number of uh challenges. Hang on, can we go back to that? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's the, it's this one. Yeah, so this square root could be um, replaced with a, a kth root, and then the yeah. degree would become d plus k. D plus k, yes. So but the I, reason I, I think mean, I agree. Very, very... I think I agree with you that, that the square root is likely to be um, sufficient in practice because this um, uh, O of square root um, uh, thing that you have to send is probably um small enough that that's not the bottleneck yeah suppose you, for I think example this is important you, to understand uh sorry go, go ahead yeah me. yeah suppose you, for example even you have two to the 30 days right the the square root is just the two to the 15 and it's already very very small and uh, usually you also have another work in the previous runs right so it, it shouldn't be an over like big overhead usually if you do square roots 
Yeah, I mean, I think you can say this actually pretty generally because the size of M, the witness, is going to be at least L. And you need to at least commit to M. Um, so the only case is, so so you're already paying for the cost of committing to M, um, which if M is dense, then that's a cost of L. So, you know, like committing to something that is squared of L should not be an overhead. Of course, there could be extreme scenarios where M is incredibly sparse. Um, so if M has a lot of zeros, um, maybe it has like on the square root of uh, like L entries, then you might want to go to a cube root. Um, but exactly as you pointed out, Dara, uh, this, this only adds like one to the degree. So it's really, really cheap uh, to do that. Um, but in general, Square root of L, uh, square root should be fine. And the advantage here is it's always a parameter, right? Depending on the different application, you can choose your parameter, which uh, you, you choose what's the optimized one, right? Yep. Um, I have a question. Uh, so I think in the paper that you referenced the very end, which uh, is linked here, uh, describes a soundness vulnerability in the original Nova protocol. Um, and I was just curious, you know, if you guys had comments on whether or not that vulnerability applied to other schemes that were based on, you know, Nova style IVC schemes and, and, uh, and how you address it in this particular construction. Yeah. So basically I think that paper, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dan, I think that paper is mostly about an, uh, correcting some vulnerability in the IVC compiler, right? This shouldn't be an issue. Actually, there's no issue for folding parts. And basically, for example, in our paper, we are just mostly focusing on folding. And then given this folding, we just uh, use any IVC compiler that actually works. For example, we just use an IVC compiler in dense paper. Then I don't think the, the that part will be affected. In particular, the, the folding part in Nova as well as the um, protostar paper will be affected at that point. Um, yeah, um, Shunbo and I looked at this for Halo, and we're we're pretty sure that we um, we didn't make the same mistake. The um, IVC is not fully implemented for for Halo two, but um, uh, in any case, it's the the mistake seemed to us to be kind of specific to um, the to what they did in Nova, and they they basically did more work than. Um, they needed to and uh, included another element in the, um, the proof that they didn't need to. And um, mm -hmm. if you're looking at it with an engineer's eye, then you would say, I, I can optimize this out and you wouldn't make a mistake. I see. So yeah, this... I mean, but I think it was in, it was essentially like you could say this was a bug in the implementation, um, not in even the Nova paper, but like, uh, you know, I think the real issue is that um, both the Nova and DCLMS, like, you know, the, the, and, and Halo and, and all the, maybe not about Halo, but like the, the, the compiler, which like when people actually implement this, when you describe it, you describe it over one curve because that's the easiest way to do it. But when people implement this, they use cycles of curves, right? They use two curves. And I think that this was just underspecified. Nobody had actually like, written up and thought about formally of like how to do this. And when it's unspecified, like people, it's easy to make uh, mistakes. And I think that is exactly what happened here. And and this sort of, uh, and like, we're totally at fault here. Like in Protostar, we don't give a precise compiler, but like, yeah, I mean, it, I think it shows like the value of like someone really going in and writing up the, the details and, I, I... Um, I agree. I sympathize with paper authors because um, this is actually really complicated and would double the length of the paper at least. Um, and I think maybe it it belongs. Um, the The form of a paper is probably not the um, the right way to do this. Um, in Halo Two, we have additional documentation. We have a Halo Two book um, that is is where things like this belong. And can be um, is not subject to um, page constraints or um, uh, it can yeah, or read a bit of specification. Yeah, can include lots of background really... information. A very, I was going to say, a very comprehensive Halo Two book 
if my memory <laughs> serves correctly. Um, yeah. But no, in, in general, it's great. And I appreciate um, your all's comments on it because I think it is, it is interesting, the interplay between theory and practice, right? And obviously at where I sit as the CEO of a layer one blockchain trying to implement cryptographic schemes and Pratish on the call, I think he's still on the call, um, you know, can probably speak to this specifically, right? The engineering of a thing versus the theory of a thing. And there's just a whole number, another dimension of complexity that gets introduced. Of course, it feels when you're writing a paper, the goal is to be general and to have it be applied in multiple contexts. But of course, in any specific system, there's specific implementation. So it uh, feels like a bit of an... Yeah, there, there's also... There's also the fact that, that the cycles of Kev were not the focus of most of these papers. Um, I mean, it was a focus of the um, uh, the original Halo paper, um, but yeah, but even that didn't um, include many of the details needed. Which I guess we should maybe explicitly recognize as I think being I think at least uh, the beginning of many of these ideas around recursion and and you know accumulation. So I think that that was a definitely yep. important yeah, moment okay. in the field. So um well and the naming scheme though no? like uh... <laughs> yeah um but yeah no i think there's also opportunities i mean of course when things get implemented and bugs like this get found it, it re results in new opportunities for research so i think it's a great i mean this is one of the great things about this group in particular is i think we have both um people who are uh practitioners as well as theorists so uh last question for me um and, and sorry to hog the mic here, but um, can you guys speak a little bit about the um, the way you see this being applied in practice, particularly uh, uh, with blockchain-based systems like the EVM? So how how concretely do you view this um, paper as being applicable to you know uh, the EVM or, or, or maybe making the EVM, the a ZK EVM is more practical? Yeah, so I think it's a kind of like a starting point, but it really, I think it really helps and uh, for the ZK EVM applications because as we can see in a lot of ZK EVM applications, they are really heavily used uh, lookup gates for, first because there are a lot of range checks and they are simulating uh, arithmetics over like two to 64 or two to uh, 32. Uh, and uh, that's the first thing. And they also heavily use high, high degree gates. And also they do, do have the problem that they need to like support multiple uh, OP codes in, in, in in uh in part, part in uh in simultaneously right and I think this our scheme is really applicable to those uh, uh to those area and can make make the ZKVM application like much more efficient and on the other hand I think that's not the end of story because for example I heard from the the engineer who implements uh, ZKVM they say one of the really bottleneck is that how to simulate memory for example like in particular in our scheme we still don't have uh, a really, really good uh, way to uh, simulating memory access beyond just committing this entire memory table inside witness because they are online. So we cannot use the sparse trick for table, a uh, pre-processed table uh, elements in, in this setting. So it's still a really uh, interesting open question if we can solve that part. If that part is solved, I think uh, like we can come to another stage, like, well, we have, we have even more efficient application and implementation for ZK UVM. And I, that's that's my understanding. Yeah. So if I can pull out, yeah, but, go ahead. Um, so my understanding is that the uh, ZK EVM, um, uh, at least the one by the Ethereum Foundation, um, depends heavily on dynamic tables. Um, yeah. So the the um, the derivatives technique um, does that support? Uh, you can support it, but it's not that efficient. Like you can still move this online table uh, as some commitments, but you don't have a uh, you don't have this trick of sparseness because we need mm -hmm. require this, those to be preprocessed. But uh, this this trick is still useful for uh, simulating bit arithmetics, right? Well, you still have uh, some fixed table yes. beforehand. That can can be another. That's an, also another really heavy part. But I agree for a dynamic table. The complexity is uh, is higher uh, if the table size is really large, but still we can support that. Basically, we can still just uh, just instead of sending the W and M, we also send the online table in the first round. That's the only difference. But that means basically you you will have uh, more more complexity for prover. Yeah. Oh, so I see. Yeah. If I could pull out uh, maybe the last bit of what you said, Benny. Uh, a minute ago, I guess it sounds like an interesting future direction of work here is, is around memory constrained provers. Is that right? So like 
provers where there's a limit on memory and therefore I'm trying to figure out how to make it more efficient in that context. Is that right? Or, or is that, is that not what you said? I think it's more the memory within the circuit, right? Like it's like the, you want to prove like the ZK EVM actually has a memory, right? Like the, yeah. the virtual machine and trying to efficiently prove like that this memory, like the memory access is reads yeah. and writes and done correctly. Simulation, yeah. so it's more simulation efficient, of the memory. Yeah. More efficient representation or simulation of memory in circuit effectively is the direction. I, I, I mean, we, we could move towards more functional um, uh, uh, smart contract languages that that don't require um, simulating memory, uh, and that they might. I mean, I think also this be is, easier um, to prove um, yeah. contracts secure. This is uh, like uh, the lurk. Lurk. Yeah, this is their direction. Approach. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, the direction from um, uh, I think originally started by protocol labs, and and they're only using you know like um, uh, I think that this was originally built with Nova. Um, and, but, you know, I think like everywhere where you use Nova, like, uh, using sort of, uh, protostar now would probably give you an improvement and, and like the main benefit is the lookups and the high degree gates and like the, the trade-off, especially for high degree gates is, is, is better than in any other scheme that we've seen before. Like in, in hyper plonk, it's already better than in plonk. Um, you can, you know, sort of, you get better trade-offs, but, but for, um, protostar, um, you have really, really like, uh, I mean, this is, you know, like, uh, again, like theory and practice, we have to see this in practice, but imagine you could support degree like easily a hundred and maybe even a thousand gates. Um, and um, hopefully those are useful, but um, you know, that's, that's I think the, the, the additional cost for, for increasing the degree really does not seem that high. Um, so uh, on the, yeah, that's on an, the interesting. Uh, on the simulating memory um, thing, is it's also worth noting that you can write in um, a uh, an imperative language and compile it to single assignment um, form, and um, what you end up with is not very different from a functional program, because um, um, the, there was a um, compiler for a language um, called Clean, which essentially did that um, uh, and got faster than C on on a um, large range of programs. Awesome. Um, well, thank you all very much. This has been a great discussion. Maybe I'll open it up to the floor in case anyone else has any final questions. Um, okay. Well, uh, thank you, Benny and Benedict, very much for being here and for presenting this work. Uh, it's really exciting and looking forward to seeing uh, how things progress from here. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thanks for inviting. Yeah, we are also really happy Thanks, to be nice. here. Yeah. Thank you. Very, you. very enthusiastic about Protostar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Awesome.